IRC and immigration sign MOU to monitor business activities. Women entrepreneurs set to host Trade Expo. And eating ice cream for a Nissan Patrol. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Wednesday's news. The Internal Revenue Commission has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Immigration and Citizenship Service Authority to strengthen cooperation between the two organizations and enhance monitoring of business activities of PNG citizens, foreign individuals and enterprises in the country. The signing was done today at the Revenue House in Port Moresby. Since Sam Coim took the role of Commissioner General with the Internal Revenue Commission, strict measures have been put in place to clamp down on tax compliance issues in Papua New Guinea. It has also resulted in a clean-up operation in-house, where IRC officers allegedly involved in corrupt deals, have issues of conflict of interest, or are simply found to be underperforming, have been terminated. The Commission has also signed partnership agreements with various provincial authorities in the country and other stakeholders to improve exchanging of information as a means of improving tax revenue collection. And today's Memorandum of Understanding signing was part of this approach, but this partnership was significant in terms of dealing with businesses, both foreigners and nationals operating in the country. Uh, what we are doing now in, in terms of the agreement with ICA is um, uh, ICA is a, a strategic partner for IRC. Uh, when it comes to tax, the residency test is a very uh, important test when it comes to uh, tax issues. And if you are an individual or if you are a an entity, residency test is also made. Uh, you will have seen that uh, immigration. We have been carrying a lot of operations uh, right across the country and uh, there's still uh, a lot of things, a uh, job needs to be done uh, to uh, uh, continue the operations but we have come to realize that there are foreign uh, companies that are operating in those areas, they even have gone into the outskirts of Papua New Guinea in doing business and uh, one thing that uh, that has always come to my mind is whether they're tax compliant or not. The agreement focuses on improving revenue collection through taxes and clamping down on business owners, particularly foreign individuals, who are not complying with PNG tax laws. The IRC also revealed last week that it is relieving stamp duty on leases, cleaning up its database for clarity in its figures regarding revenue collection, and identifying businesses with tax identification numbers that are either operating illegally or not paying tax to the government. And the Commissioner General says there will be penalties imposed accordingly. If you uh, hold taxes and you want to take a overseas trip, then we can also prevent you from enjoying your time offshore with your money kept offshore. Dennis Orere, National MTV News. Simbu SME Foundation is on a mission to implement policies of the SME program. Foundation Managing Director Peter Siune says the pilot program aims to tie the informal sector in the province, especially the unemployed. A launch was organized at Kundiawa's Dixon Oval recently. Speaking to MTV, the head of Simbu SME Foundation says the SME sector is an opportunity to help rebuild the economy. Siune says the informal sector has the number to do that. He says the foundation wants to implement the SME policy through bottom-up planning. From uh, the world level to the uh, international level, where SME foundation is uh, basically strategized on uh, how the SME concept in a country will be uh, implementing its uh, policies in uh, delivering the SME uh, program. The economy of Simbu province is driven by the agriculture sector. Coffee and fresh produce are the main income earner. With the foundation pushing the pilot program, the head says levels of government must include ordinary citizens who are less privileged. Siune says policies must be inclusive. In Simbu province, we are taking uh, as a pilot program and then delivering um, 
the concept of how we will uh, uh, put all the business uh, uh, stakeholders, especially the SME, into a package and then addressing the issues and the programs to a level of governments in the country. For the next five months, the Simbu SME Foundation will run programs targeting rural communities. With the government allocating nearly half a million for the sector, the foundation wants to collaborate with stakeholders and assist locals benefit and grow the economy. The concepts that we are developing, it is now underway for uh, formalities wise to at least uh, uh, we give some form of recognition to those uh, SME stakeholders in the province to basically know about what the uh, level of government, I mean, level of assistance that they will receive from the government. Jack Lapava Jr., National MTV News. Hela province has reported its first coronavirus case with a 30-year-old male from Taripuri district. West New Britain also reported four new COVID-19 cases in the last 24 hours, three male and one female, all from Talasia district. The rapid response teams of both Hela and West New Britain are conducting case investigations and contact tracing. To date, PNG has 597 cases and seven COVID-19 deaths. There have been 580 people who have recovered from COVID-19, whilst there are 10 active cases that are being isolated. 15 provinces have confirmed COVID-19 cases. And National MTV News continues with more stories after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back. The proud winner of the much-anticipated winner fully kitted Nissan Patrol with Gala ice cream formally received her grand prize today. 20-year-old Delma Kife from Goroka is now the owner of a brand new fully kitted Nissan Patrol. Worth over 180,000 kina, the young lass was called into Paradise Foods head office today to collect her prize thanks to Laga Industries, the makers of Gala ice cream. Delma won the Nissan Patrol after purchasing Gala products worth only, believe it or not, 3 kina 50. It's not every day someone walks away with a Nissan Patrol after spending 3 kina 50 on ice cream. On October 2nd at 3.20 p.m., Delma bought a Gala tea shake with a Gala Jungle Pops for a total spend of 3 kina 50 at Stalin Freezes in Waigani Central, Port Moresby. She wrote her name and contact details on the back of the receipt and dropped it in the entry box. She had no idea that she was going to drive away with the grand prize. Laga Industries, under its brand Gala Ice Cream, drew the entries on October 30th. And Delma's receipt was the lucky entry drawn. Time bossman and ring time and me the, me hard love expressing me because I'm surprised me surprised that na me so Na all family all all sing out na Mlo around Friday around three o'clock. The promotion received over two hundred and eighty thousand entries nationwide, with its entry as low as ninety toya. This is the biggest promotion we've run for Gala this year, so it's been uh, very successful. Uh, we've uh, increased sales a lot, so people were very responsive to it. It'd be something fun to do again. In showing an appreciation to Laga Industries, Delma, who is from Eastern Islands, added parents present Paradise Foods Limited's group CEO, James Rice, and Laga Industries National Sales Manager, Dorian Fernandez, with billooms. <laughs> outside, a friends and relatives from ATS Settlement outside Port Mosby cheered on under the burning sun while listening to Gomohane. The promotion ran for 10 weeks and also has 50 Constellation Mountain bike winners nationwide. Yana Zoyeri, National MTV News. Police prosecutors attending to criminal court matters at the Waigani Committal Court in Port Moresby were unable to mention cases listed today. NCD Metropolitan Superintendent Perodrano told MTV News there was no electricity supply to pump fuel for police, use to, police to use their vehicles today. This affected today's court hearings, including the transportation of defendants from both the police custody at Boroko and those remanded at Bomana Prison. Clerks at the 
Wagani District Court Registry advised all defendants and their lawyers to check with the registry for their adjournment dates. This is the second time in two weeks where court cases have been adjourned due to shortage in fuel supply for police vehicles. The Academy for Women Entrepreneurs will be hosting a trade expo on the 17th and 18th of this month to encourage more PNG women into the program. The Academy for Women Entrepreneurs is a U.S. program supporting women entrepreneurs around the world. The Academy for Women Entrepreneurs is a global program that started in PNG in 2019. The Academy, in support of the White House-led Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative, aims to equip women with practical skills needed to create sustainable businesses and enterprises. This includes creating business plans and raising capital with the goal of building a better future for their families and communities. In August 2019, Papua New Guinea, or the U.S. Embassy in Port Mosby, was the first country in Asia and the Pacific to have piloted the program. Since the program started in PNG, over 50 women have participated. Some of these women will be part of the Trade Expo the Academy will host on the 17th and 18th of this month at the Port Mosby Arts Theatre. The main aim of the expo is for the SMEs, the women that went through the program from the last year, first cohort, 2019 cohort, to this year, and those that register to participate to basically exhibit their products and services of their different SMEs to the public. Uh, the other aim of the expo is to create a platform for networking between SMEs and um, different stakeholders that are uh, provide essential services to the SME sector in Papua New Guinea and as well as other business houses and partners who are supportive of, you know, women in entrepreneurship. Women participating in AWE will engage in facilitated lessons on business management and networking with like-minded entrepreneurs and mentors. You have a business idea but you don't have a blueprint on how you want to run your business. So Dream Builder creates that business plan for you. At the end of the program, when you're answering the questions, as you go through the modules, automatically it's created into a business plan. So when you finish the 13th module, you just click on generate and it generates the business plan for you in a Word document. For more information, the public is welcome to visit the Trade Expo. We're also selling our tickets right now, so feel free to get in touch with us or connect with us on our Facebook page. That's also the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs-PNG, and you can purchase a ticket. We would really love for women to come and uh, come to the expo because during the expo we will also be giving information on the application process for the program that's offered by the academy for, and also information on women who are interested in business to come to the expo to get that. Shamin Poriam of National MTV News. An agriculture doctoral student studying in Australia says the government has to give serious thought to the opinions expressed by the people of Morbe. Abna Yalu from Nawai District says the plans for the government to allow the dumping of mine waste into the Huon Gulf is wrong, despite the economic arguments. He says the simple fact that pollutants will go into a food source is highly concerning. I personally, in my own opinion, I would want to see the government broadening its um, broadening its economic base more into manufacturing. We can bring countries from uh, other big companies like you know automobile or Toyota or whatever to actually start assembling vehicles in PNG, computers in PNG. IT knowledge has grown to such an extent that people are fixing mobile phones on our streets now in the market. So why can't we start going into formally where bringing Nokia? And we are some assemble things like that in PNG. Countries like Rwanda and in Africa, they're already doing it. And so manufacturing is a there's big employment opportunity in manufacturing industries. And there's also big employment opportunities in IT and agriculture. And so like there's so much sustainable options out there. It's not like we are running out of options. If we were out of options, definitely we would, you know, things like mining can take, you know, can you know be considered as the only option, but 
Kabum Health Center in Morbe continues to face medicine shortage since 2018. MTV News visited Kabum District last week and found out that there are no antibiotics, painkillers, gauze and other common drugs at the health center to treat patients. The health center sent their orders in almost four months ago and is still waiting for their medical supplies. This was the state of Kabum Health Center's dispensary when we visited Kabum last week. The shelves were all empty. No antibiotics, no painkillers, gauze, masks and other common drugs. Pharmacist Dimbong Diwong, who has been in charge of this dispensary for 10 years, said he had sent orders for their medical supplies in August and he is still waiting. Within two months, so I'm meeting the working care now, but I'm not coming yet. I'm 26, 27, 28, 29 this time. I'm just working There has been a chronic medicine shortage since 2018. This led to the inquiry by the Public Accounts Committee that saw senior health officers, pharmaceutical and logistic companies contracted by the government for the supply and distribution of medicines questioned. Unfortunately, the PAC inquiry ended because of COVID-19. Marasin bin blasot ol sigma ne wet tasol go one bla marasin tasol lem kus marasin ot em tasol ol gimi blasta. When we interviewed the patients, they said the health officers are working, but there are no medicines and equipment. A ward council of Celepet LLG said a sticky tape was used by the health workers when he was admitted here at the Kabum Health Center. A sticky tape ino ride one im blasot by dressing ol swa. Because me looking most of all workman no all find him in our one pla and something in a block all by use him now help him all me plus sick man Mary. MTV News contacted a health officer from the Kabum Health Center this afternoon to confirm if they have received the medical supplies and was told that the medicines have still not arrived. The health officers followed up with the area medical store in Ley and was informed that the order was packed and sent to them following their order in August. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News. A partnership formed in 2012 is now two weeks away from harvesting its economic benefits in the Sipic Plains. The Sipic Chicken Farm, when in full operation, is expected to be a major supplier of chicken layers in East Sipic and neighboring provinces. The launching of the brand today coincided with the signing of an MOA for a cocoa exporting business. Partners in this massive economic investment include the Yanguru South Sea District Development Authority, Innovative Agro Industries, the state through the Kumul Agriculture Limited, and local farmers. The Yanguru South Sea District is a shining example for other districts in the country. It has identified, is capitalizing on its natural resources, energetic people, and fertile soil to develop income earning activities that can improve village health, family livelihoods and the local economy. The brand name Sipic Fresh, which is anticipated to be distributed to major shopping outlets in East Sipic, was inspired by a grade 5 student. While the logo was proposed and designed by two students from Dienga Primary in Wiwek. The yellow uh, presents uh, the unity between the people and the leadership in Yanguru. The blue represents the mountains of East and West Yanguru, and the green, of course, represents the plains. The prize for the best name brand is 1,000 Kina. For the best logo design is 2,000 Kina, and both schools will each receive an additional 2,000 Kina. The chicken sheds built at Uwaripmo in the East Yanguru LLG was built with innovative technology. It has the capacity to control lightings, temperature, and even the amount of food and water supplied to the chicken. Today, a check of 470,000 kina was presented to Ideal Hardware to build sheds for pioneer chicken farmers in the district. All these years, the Pacific region has been importing eggs and chicken meat from Lake, Zeneg and Unitary <coughs> Birds. The chapter is closing. <coughs> the chapter is closing now. We're going to produce our own and we are looking to markets like Indonesia. 
the increase in economic opportunities for locals in the Yanguru Sausia District reflects the vision of the Yanguru Sausia District Development Authority with the unveiling of the Sepik Chicken Farm logo in Port Mosby today locals in Yanguru Sausia are expected to make thousands of kina from the sale of their chicken 20,000 uh, in registered survey plan other 20,000 year to be year to be um, registered and there are 40,000 of that 80,000 target from the customary land mobilization is here to be delivered and we pray that the support of Shin Waigani will be lifted so that we can progress to deliver the mighty civic plains. The Sipic Chicken Farm is an investment under the Sipic Economic Zone project aimed at creating economic ventures for locals. Through the signing of a MOA for a cocoa exporting business, the DDA and its development partners aims to invest 500,000 kina each as initial equity for the new business. Thaklagunga, National MTV News. And now looking at the Nasfund market report, the Kina closed unchanged at 0 0.2860 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina is buying 0.2785 US dollars, 0.3848 Australian dollars, 0.2295 Euro and 28.46 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading higher. Coffee, cocoa and copper closed higher. Crude oil is trading higher, palm oil and copper closed the day higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 554.98 points higher. The ASX 200 is trading at 6.16 points higher. And the All Ordinaries is trading at 5.18 points higher. Among stories after the break, authorities in East New Britain urged to address missing tourism funds. That and more after the break. Welcome back to the news. Over the past nine days, a team of trackers took on the challenge to walk the Finisterre mountain range from Morbe to Medang. The team, headed by a community-based organization in Bundi, the Kumura Foundation, completed the walk to raise funds for the foundation's key education and health projects for 2021. The team of 24 started the 130-kilometer track from Wantoat in Morbe on the 25th of October and arrived in Saidor, Medang province yesterday. Foundation Director Vincent Kumura said the track was challenging due to several unbridged river crossings and steep climbs. Earlier this year, the foundation, along with health workers from Chimbu, conducted a medical patrol along the Medang-Chimbu border, followed by a rural kids' excursion to Goroka, as part of the education program. With this walk, they hope to raise 60,000 kina for key education and health projects. While there might not be any women representatives in the national parliament, women are being voted to represent their people in the sub-national level as councillors and LLG reps. This week, 30 of these women met in lay for a UN Women meeting aimed at showcasing and empowering women leaders. This meeting comes with hopes of empowering women leaders. These women leaders come from the Highlands, Momase and New Guinea Islands regions. They represent their people at the LLG and ward levels in their provinces. They are currently in Leh this week attending a UN women gathering aimed at showcasing the women's representations at the sub-national level. And these are, this is one of the priorities of UN women uh, and the Department for Community Development and Religion is shared priority for us to strengthen their capacity to be effective leaders and showcase the work that women are already doing in leadership positions um, across the country. While there have been women leaders in the parliament in the past, there are no women in the current national parliament. 
While some of the women present at this forum are first-timers, others have served as councillors and LLG reps for several terms. Minister for Community Development and Religion, Wake Goy, who was present to open the forum, said meetings like these will encourage women to take on higher leadership roles in politics. And to see more display information that maybe like school them all, or all school them all, or you see them can guide them all so that all can come up a good leader at the local level, a good leader at the provincial level. Now, out of that, the best ones can, you know, somehow grow the hope or do I hope and they can come up to the national level. This forum is an avenue for these women to share their stories and challenges as women representatives in their societies and was organized by UN Women in partnership with the Department of Community Development and Religion. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lee. The East New Britain Chamber of Commerce President David Stein has called on the fraud squad to provide the outcome of an investigation into the alleged misuse of tourism money in East New Britain. Mr. Stein says the investigation ended three months ago. The investigation was prompted by ongoing concerns in the province over deteriorating infrastructures that were meant to be fixed to using the funds. Yeah, mm -hmm. all right. David Stein has been a lone voice advocating on anti-corruption and alleged misuse of public office and money in East New Britain province in recent years. But one issue that has stood out has been the 20 million kina tourism money that was provided by the national government in 2015 to boost tourism activities in the province. That tourism money has since become a subject of discussion. The figures that were given added up to 21 million, uh, not 20 million, uh, in the the acquittals that were given. The money provided between 2015 and 2016 as a tourism grant wasn't accounted for. Following mounting concerns on the whereabouts of the funds, a police investigation commenced in June this year into how the money was used. A team of police personnel from the fraud squad in Port Moresby travelled to East Newburton province to carry out the investigation. We need the fraud squad to, um, to uh, come back to East New Britain as soon as possible and complete that investigation and, and give a report so that the people of East New Britain know what has happened to the 20 million kina that was given by the national government for tourism funding and it hasn't met the mark. Joining the call is Arthur Luluai, an anti-corruption advocate in the province who shared similar sentiments. Mr Luluai claimed he was silenced by senior provincial government officials while trying to question the provincial administration regarding the tourism grant. So uh, we, the people of East New Britain, uh, would like uh, them to come back to complete their task. Questions on how the money was spent was put to the former Tourism, Arts and Culture Minister Emil Tamur prior to the government reshuffle. Mr Tamur, however, had denied knowing how the money was used. He says the tourism grant was provided prior to his term in office, but it is understood the money was spent on projects not related to tourism. That money was given to the provincial government uh, to do um, um, development within the tourism industry in the province and the provincial government has done a report and the onus is on them now to come out and present the report. So. so far the outcome of the investigation conducted three months ago still remained unclear. The provincial administration has remained silent on this matter. The only representative within the provincial government who has spoken out publicly has been the Kokopo MP and the former Tourism, Arts and Culture Minister Emil Tamur. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. And turning overseas, the coronavirus pandemic and unprecedented number of ballots cast early, the lack of consistency about how these votes will be counted, and ongoing legal battles have made the outcome of the 2020 U.S. presidential election one of the hardest to predict. Some states like Atlanta have postponed counting and results are likely to be out tomorrow. As Americans head to polling stations, the question is not just whether Republican President Donald Trump will win a second term or be defeated by his Democratic rival Joe Biden, but also when the results will be known. A number of states have gone into early voting, however, some of these states will not begin count of the early votes until after polling stations close. 
While majority of states have closed polling stations, some states like Atlanta, for example, will not conclude its counting tonight. And if the presidential race depends on the outcomes in these states, America and the world included could be waiting another day for the results. Experts have cautioned against reading too much into early returns, which could be distorted by how each state processes the votes not cast in person on election day. What many don't understand is the election of the president depends on the number of electoral votes they receive. These votes are cast by members of the U.S. Electoral College, which is made up of a group of people representing the states. Each state has many electors as it has senators and representatives in Congress. There are 538 electors in total and each one represents one electoral vote. The candidate who receives a majority of 270 or more electoral votes wins the presidency. At present, majority of the states have voted red in support of Republican Donald Trump. However, the latest opinion polls show the race is close enough in the battleground states to swing the outcome to either party, even as Biden leads Trump in national polls. Meanwhile, Americans themselves have played key roles in the unfolding drama. Millions are exercising their democratic right to vote on their own terms, cheered by onlookers around the world. What else but a few bars of mariachi to celebrate voting for the very first time? Salvadora Matia recently becoming a U.S. citizen at 73 years of age. Traditions also on display a vast distance away to the east in Texas. Growing up in this area, we use our horses to go to school, we use our horses to go to the store, and why not use your horse to go vote? Voter excitement sweeping right the way to the eastern seaboard with dancing in the streets in Miami, democracy the dish of the day. In Colorado, prisoners voted early. The very first time inmates here could cast their own votes. But it was voting with a twist in Puerto Rico, which held a non-binding referendum for statehood, seeking to become America's 51st state and giving citizens the right to vote. Por eso voy a votar. I hope that someday we will finally be a state and for the people to understand we're nothing without the United States, this voter explains. Her opponents, though, likening the move to colonialism. In Los Angeles, chilling out the order of the day, many in Santa Monica voting early. I, I didn't want to vote for Trump. I honestly think it'll be much like the last one. But in India, they're praying for Kamala Harris to be the next vice president in the village where her grandfather was born. In Nigeria, large numbers rallying for Trump. And in Australia, Republican supporters now gathering to watch the results roll in. But in the land of the free, it appears music's the big winner on the streets. And Trukai Sports is next. Fidelis Sukina is at the sports desk. Yes, Helen, we'll have some news on rugby union and volleyball after the break. Stay with us. Tukai Sports. And welcome to Tukai Sports. Capital Rugby Union in Port Moresby started its top four playoff with only two more rounds remaining in the competition. The men's premier competition is the only division playing for this season in a round robin format with the two last rounds a playoff for the top four and bottom four. The Capital Rugby Union season for 2020 started on the second week of September after a prolonged off-season on the sidelines due to the COVID-19 pandemic induced lockdown sidelining all sporting activities in the early part of this year. After consultations with clubs and competition executives, the competition was reduced to just the men's premier division, with only eight teams taking part in ten rounds of competition. 
It was played without crowds, but the recent lifting of restrictions has brought in the crowds for the remainder of the season. After seven weeks of competition, the remaining three rounds is a top four, bottom four playoff, which started last weekend in round eight. This weekend we will have uh, two more matches, which will be the round nine and round ten match. What we have done is uh, at the co uh, conclusion of the round seven match, we have uh, deep, based on the points table at the end of round seven, we have split the pool into a, a top four and a bottom four concept. So the Bottom four will play for the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth spot, obviously, and the top four will uh, vie for the first, second, third, and fourth. Leading the competition after round seven were the Harley Queens, who lost to the University Piggies on Saturday in round eight. Uh, based on the ra round seven standings, the top four was uh, first place Credit Corporation Harley Queens, second place uh, Kramer Senko Brothers, uh, third place Gangloff Consulting University and uh, fourth place was uh, Valley Hunters. Because of the shortened season, club officials and the competition executives have opted out of a traditional final series. Amid caution, the final series would have dragged on into the festive season. Instead, after seven rounds of competition, teams in the top four and the bottom four will battle it out for placings in which the team that finishes first after these playoffs will be announced the winner of the 2020 competition. For 2020, it was decided by the executives not to have a, a finals because it would go into the Christmas New Year period. So that was the reason why we had a round robin of 10 matches. But just to spice things up, all the clubs plus the executives agreed to have a round robin for seven, seven games. And then at the end of the seven games, top four, bottom four playoff for rounds eight, nine and ten. So it's basically whoever finishes at the top will be declared 2020 premiers. And the Papua New Guinea Volleyball Federation will officially launch their national championships tomorrow. The federation has confirmed 12 associations to date with the under-21 divisions kicking off on the 5th to the 7th of November and the open divisions from the 7th to the 10th with Bank South Pacific coming on board for the second time with a 50,000 kina sponsorship, the tournament draws will be announced during the opening ceremony tomorrow. The Federation will also host, host its annual general meeting, where a new look executive is expected to be announced. And Trukai Sports continues after the break. Stay with us. Trukai Sports. And welcome back to Trukai Sports. To cycling, riders in New Zealand today completed their toughest challenge yet, a steep six-kilometer climb up the remarkable racetrack for the first time in the event. It's one of the country's most picturesque mountain ranges, but for the riders, it was far from pretty. Instead, a scorching steep, sharp slog, climbing 600 metres in six kilometres. Perhaps fitting and somewhat advantageous, it was local Reuben Thompson who made Tour of Southland history. <laughs> kind of what got me into cycling really so to come back and yeah race this tour and, and win a stage um, yeah just super special a remarkable feat quite literally for the 19 year old who got out of quarantine just 24 hours prior to the tour starting I, yeah, I had a mate drop off a, a indoor trainer and tried to stay as fit as possible um, doing sort of double sessions days um, and yeah got out Saturday morning flew down from Auckland and got one night at home and then down Sunday morning to Invercargill from Queenstown to, to get started. It caps off a crucial day at the halfway point of the tour. The 108 kilometre stage starting out in Mossburn, through five rivers, along the Wakatipu Basin and past the iconic Devil Staircase. It was there Thompson broke away from the peloton headed for home. And while all the riders had their day in the heat... Switch your hands together, here's the yellow jersey leader, Ruben Thompson. Yeah, how's this for a moment in the sun? And that story and Strukai Sports. Helen will be back with the weather report for the next 24 hours. Bye for now. Strukai Sports.
True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow. Thundery rain showers and drizzles easing tonight. Then a fine cloudy morning in Port Moresby. In Daru, cloudy with rain drizzles tonight and tomorrow morning. Occasional rain showers and thunder tonight. Then a fine cloudy morning in Kerma, Alatau and Popandita. In the Mamasu region, cloudy with some rain drizzles tonight, then a fine cloudy morning in Lei. Cloudy with rain showers tonight, then a fine cloudy morning in Medang. Cloudy tonight with possible rain showers in the morning in Wewak and cloudy with rain drizzles tonight and tomorrow morning in Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region in Loringau, cloudy with rain drizzles tonight, then a fine cloudy morning tomorrow. Rain showers easing tonight, then a fine cloudy morning in Kavieng. Occasional rain showers and thunder tonight with a cloudy morning in Kokopo and Rabaul. Cloudy with rain drizzles in Kimbe and thundery rain showers easing tonight with a fine cloudy morning in Buka. And in the Highlands region, thundery rain showers and drizzles tonight, then a f morning fog in Mount Hagen, Goroka and Kundiawa. And occasional rain showers and drizzles with thunder tonight, then morning fog tomorrow in Mendi and Wabeg. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that's the way it is this Wednesday, the 4th of November 2020. On behalf of the news team, pleasant viewing. Good night.